Matthew Lecky puts Australia into the quarterfinals. That is a magnificent goal by Owamabil. Oh, Matty Ryan, wow! Camping it out of the top corner like Superman. Hello and welcome to the Soccer Is podcast, where we go one-on-one with your favourite players to keep you connected with the Socceroos. My name is Michael Putterflam. On this episode, we chat with Socceroo cap number 598. After becoming Australia's first captain of African heritage, he led the under-23s to qualification for their first Olympic Games in 12 years. Shortly after the tournament in Thailand, he confirmed a move overseas to Japan, having played over 70 games for Melbourne Victory and winning multiple trophies. Now, he's primed to take his career to the next level. His name is Thomas Dang. Dangy, thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. Firstly, how's everything going with you? Uh, thanks for having me. Everything's going all right at the moment. You know, it's it's a bit crazy um, with the, the current situation. Like, uh, I'm, I'm adapting to the life here in Japan and enjoying the football and, and also my, my life. But uh, everything's put on, on hold at the moment. It's a bit hard because, uh, because of all the, the isolation and people are scared and um, so it's it's a bit of a rough time. So tell us where are you right now, and you know what's been happening the last couple of weeks for you. So I, I live in a place called uh, Saitama. It's about maybe thirty minutes from Tokyo. So with all this situation that's going on, we, we've still been we've been training up until about two days ago. So the Japanese uh, government have said that they they've tried to contain. Um, this virus as, as best as they could and that's the reason why we've still been training and we've been playing friendly games behind closed doors and then recently they had a meeting on the 25th of March the J-League Association and they said that the the league got postponed until the 9th of May and then they gave us a week off basically to, to stay at home and to relax and isolate and then depending on how everything goes we'll see if, if we're going to go back to training or um, if the league is going to start. And how has that been for you, obviously, coming over after signing, starting training, and then this kind of all kicking off? What have your feelings been throughout this process? It's been a crazy one. Like, everything happened so fast um, with the signing and me coming over here. And then, like, this has just put everything on pause um, and stopped everything. But I think it's it's more. This is um, people's health and and well being is is more important than, than anything at the moment um, than any sport. So I think we just got to look after our health and and also our loved ones. And currently, what are the actual the rules around COVID nineteen for you in Tokyo? Are you allowed to go out? Do you have to kind of stay in your apartment? Yeah, like recently, like we've been we've been going out. There's supermarkets and restaurants have still been open. But they just put this uh, this rule in place for the weekend for everyone to stay home and just to, to stay isolated because of the, the recent cases. So that's the reason I think they kind of gave us that week off to let everything die off. So I'm, I'm not too sure what's happening at the moment. I'm, I'm just trying to get as much information from, from people around the club, uh, my translator and, and, and such. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your, your setup. You mentioned that you, you have a translator. You know, what other kind of things do the club make available for you while you're over there? Yeah, I've got a translator. Pretty nice apartment here in Saitama. So it's, uh, it's about five minutes from the training center. I've got everything I need. It's close by to, to shopping centers. And yeah, it's, it's quite easy to get around. Um, and also, like, one of my, uh, my Dutch teammates lives around the corner. So about two minutes away from me, so... Me and him are always together, but yeah, like they've they've made everything pretty easy setting me up here, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable um, with life here in Japan. And tell us a little bit about how are you finding your teammates and how's the training in terms of the standard. Yeah, at first it was kind of it was kind of a shock at first when I when I come in and um, I went to the training camp in Okinawa, which is uh, I think it's south of Japan or something. I was there for about three days. I missed like the whole month. And then we basically just came back and went straight into the league. So for me, it was, it was quite tough trying to understand the tactics side and um, what the coaches and the players wanted for me. So in a way, like this virus kind of 
helped me in, a, in, in giving me extra time and in, in understanding what my role is and also understanding yeah, what, what the coaches and, and the players want for me. So now I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting used to everything and um, also the tempo and, yeah, I'm, I'm just getting fitter. The training loads are a bit a bit harder here compared to, to the A-League. So, yeah, it took, took a few weeks to, to get used to that. And, you know, before or after you signed, were you reaching out to any Aussies who um, had played in the J-League before just to get their thoughts on what it would oh, be for like? Me it was, for me, it was good because uh, Andy, Andy was here for a year and a half and then he came back to victory. So um, when I signed, he, me and him were, were speaking on WhatsApp so he sent me through some, a bit of information about the club and also about the Japanese people and the culture. One of the things he said is, uh, "Don't be late to any meetings and try try to be extra early and be respectful." So, he's, uh, some good some good pointers. Obviously, someone like uh, Mitch Langerak's also over there. Do you kind of keep in contact with him? Yeah, I spoke to Mitch the other day. Actually, um, he called me and he was talking about the. The cases in Tokyo. So he was the first person to tell me. So he, he was basically just said to go to go to the supermarket and, and try to get as much things as you can before uh, people start to panic and go crazy. Uh, but yeah, yeah, me and him have been in contact on WhatsApp and also Jason Guerrier. Um, Jason's not far from me. He's about an hour. So we, we met we met up about three weeks ago for dinner. It's, it's good to have a few Aussies close by and. Obviously, you know, COVID-19 has been an interruption, but have you got a chance to kind of sample the Japanese lifestyle, the food, you know, the technology kind of boom they've got there? Yeah, I, I kind of got a little taste of, uh, of how, of the Japanese culture and the food here. I've been to a few restaurants, Japanese restaurants, and um, also trying out different foods and, and things like that. And also going into Tokyo and doing a bit of shopping and, you know, trying to get to know the place. It's obviously been a big few months for yourself, captaining the under-23s to help them qualify for the Olympics and then the signing as well. We've recently had the postponement of the Olympics. What were your feelings, you know, around that announcement when it happened? I was a bit gutted about the announcement, but as I said before, like, I think people's health and uh, well-being is uh, the most important thing right now. Sport is the last thing that we should be thinking about. I think, uh, yeah, we need we need people healthy and, and safe at the moment. And then next year, the, the games will be played in, in the summer, so which isn't too bad. I'm not too uh, disappointed. Um, I think it was a good decision by the Australian committee, Olympic committee. Obviously, you just had your, your 23rd birthday as well. So they have that, that under-23s rule for the Olympics, I mean, that yeah. you can have people above the age of 23. Next year, you potentially be 24. So unless the rules change, that could impact your ability to go play at the Olympics. What yeah. would it mean to you to have the opportunity to actually be able to play at the Olympics? Being able to represent my country at the Olympics is, would be an honour. We haven't qualified for a long time. I think it was about 12 years, wasn't it, last time we, we qualified. So to get to this main stage would be, uh, would be a dream come true. And it possibly could change your uh, your career. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that experience, what it was like to be part of that team and lead that team. That's probably the, the toughest tournament I've ever played in, to be honest. The heat and the humidity in, in Bangkok is, uh, was uh, was crazy. Just every game, every training just took everything out of you. And we were playing in, in the group stages, I think we were playing every, uh, every two, three days. So the turnaround was very short and so for for some players to back up game to game was uh, was very difficult in these conditions, but yeah, being able to to captain the team um, and also to to qualify was uh, yeah it was an honour, and the boys uh, did uh, did very well as I said with the conditions. And people don't really understand um, when they're watching on TV how how difficult it is, and in this uh, in this heat sometimes your your mind goes so it's. Uh, it's a real uh, mental game. But yeah, the boys held it together and uh, I'm extremely proud and I'm grateful for also for the coaching staff, Arnie and, and Rene as well, taking their time out to, to really help us qualify for this, uh, for the games. Without them, it would have been, it wouldn't have been uh, possible. So you spoke about how difficult the conditions were playing those games. Is there one game in particular 
when you think back to the ones that were played that really sticks out as being the most difficult? Yeah, it was Syria. Yeah, I think that was that was the most difficult game. We played 120 minutes, and I remember like in the in the extra time, I couldn't move. I was playing right back, and all my legs just locked up, both calves, both hammies, quads, everything locked up, and I, I just I was basically a mannequin on the field. And uh, I remember Arnie getting Keanu to to basically cover, come and play for me, come play uh, right back. And I was basically just standing there doing nothing <laughs> because we ran out of subs. <laughs> I reckon that's that's the most difficult game for for me um, and also for the team playing 120 minutes. But yeah, b- being able to get through that, I think gave us more uh, more strength and belief to do well. Yeah, I was going to ask what helped you guys as a team get through those games and eventually qualify. Yeah, the the belief was very strong with the squad and and. Also, the, the t- togetherness as well. We had a really, really tight group and also the staff were really good with us from the start to the end of the tournament. Each game, we uh, we were getting fitter and, you know, we started to build endurance. By the end of, uh, by the end of, towards the end of the tournament, we were really fit. And it showed in the last game. We, we performed very well against Uzbekistan and we could have probably scored maybe two or three goals and finished them off, but yeah, the boys boys were in really good condition towards the end. And, uh, yeah, especially me as well, coming back from injury and going um, straight to, to Bangkok. Um, the first few games was uh, was very difficult. Um, but, you know, having Clarky, Andrew Clark, he, he really uh, put us in a, in a good condition and he maintained us uh, really well throughout the tournament. And are there any players who really stood out for you within the squad or is it really a combined team effort? Uh, Reno, Reno Pascorpo was probably one of the best players in that tournament. Yeah, he, he showed a lot of quality and, you know, he's, I think he set up a few goals as well. He set up a really crucial goal in, uh, when we played Thailand, the Daggers goal and, you know, scoring a, scoring a bomb as well against uh, Iran. And he's, uh, he really stood out for me. And also uh, there's a young boy called Dylan who plays in, in Holland. He's, uh, he's, I think he's only 19, so he really, he really stood out as well. He performed well, and he's, uh, yeah, he, he did really, did, did really good. And obviously yourself, only being 23, but also being the captain. You know, what was it like to kind of be able to work with those younger players and potentially pass across some of the things that you've learned on your journey so far? Yeah, we've got really, we've got a really good, um, really talented squad, especially with the young boys. Um, coming up, I think this experience I think will really will be really good for them um, and also for their careers if they do end up going to the Olympics. And I think we we need more players like this, um, especially for the Socceroos as well. So for me, being part of the team, you know, experiencing how it's like being with the Socceroos set up and also being able to play in the last Oliroos and with different players and, you know, understanding Asian football so kind of kind of helped me and um, I try to try to help the team as much as I could. Speaking of the soccer, is, it'd be great to maybe just switch gear and speak about your memories of making your soccer is debut end of 2018. Same game as AYM Mobile against Kuwait. What, what are your memories from that, from that time? Craziest thing, I think that day, was it the day before I was telling AYM, that you'll score if you come on, and yeah, when he when he when he did make his debut, he came on and, uh, and scored straight away, and he, he made an impact. And then also me being able to make my debut on the same day was like a dream come true. So me and Awa we've known each other for, for over ten years, and you know we grew up together in the same area in in, uh, in Andrew's farm in uh, in Adelaide. Yeah, we grew up together, went to the same school, and you know. We, we used to play at the park every day with each other, so we've known each other for a long time, and we have a, a really good bond. And I think on that day it was really special, and it's something that we're going to remember for the rest of our lives. Things and that you, we can tell our kids. Do you stay in close contact with Awa? Obviously, he's overplaying in Denmark. Yeah, I, I try to speak um, to him as much as I can uh, on WhatsApp. Yeah, he's uh, he's doing he was doing really well um, before this uh, this crisis. I think their, their team was about a few points clear at the top of the table and he was scoring a few goals and 
also playing really well. I think it's uh, probably one of his best uh, best seasons uh, seasons in his career. In terms of you know being able to represent Australia, um, what did that mean to you to be able to make your debut? Yeah, as I said, for every kid that watches the Socceroos and they they expire uh, aspire to you know one day play for the green and gold and and represent our country. So for me, it was it was an honour and it's it's something that I'll I'll cherish forever. You know, making my debut and um, playing for the Socceroos and I think um, yeah, I'm I'm very grateful um, to get that opportunity because uh, there's uh, there's thousands of kids they'll be dying for, um, for this opportunity and yeah. I'm really, I'm uh, really grateful for that. We might switch gears a little bit and talk about some of your your earliest soccer is memories. Do you remember kind of, you know, the first game soccer is game you watched, or maybe, you know, your favourite soccer that stood out for you as a kid? Um, I have the moment the the Bresciano goal was uh, one of the, the biggest moments. I think it was in, in Sydney, uh, and I saw uh, I saw an interview about his. Uh, I think about his father that was in the crowd as well. So it had a really, uh, a really good, um, a good story behind uh, behind it, and um, and also the John Aloisi uh, penalty when he's running around the the whole field and everyone's going crazy. He qualified for the Olympic, I mean for the for the World Cup. Yeah, those are probably the two uh, two highlights that uh, that comes up. So you must have been how old? Eight years old. Being in the crowd at that point, yeah, I would have been, I would have been pretty young at that time. Yeah, I would have been pretty young. You know, seeing that game, did that instill in you the want and desire to play for Australia? Um, at that age, I wasn't too sure. You know, at that age, you, you just you playing, you playing the game because you love it, and you, you're not too sure about anything at the moment. But like at that time, I think that when I would probably turn about. 12 years old I started to get a bit more serious and I started to really focus on you know what I wanted to do and, and I I even pushed um, pushed my parents to to take me everywhere in Adelaide and drive me around and and tell us about your your earliest memories of football what kind of stands out for you when you think back as far as you can first time kicking a ball or first time playing uh, my first club in, uh, in in Australia was a club in Adelaide called uh, Adelaide Blue Eagles, um, an Italian club. Uh, that was the first club me and my brother joined and also one of my cousins as well. So, yeah, I remember that because, uh, yeah, we all joined together and we were there for many years, about six, seven years. And I also left and went to Adelaide City and then I came back. That's, uh, yeah, my first club in, in Australia and... You know, I have uh, really, really good memories and also some friends there. And it was great that we played a FA Cup game there. I think it was about three years ago when I first come back from, from Holland. We played Adelaide United at the, at our ground. So, um, yeah, it was, it was good. It was a good memory and, uh, yeah, it was good to, to visit and see familiar faces. Do you just want to talk through your story of coming to Australia, becoming a part of Australian society? Yeah, so my... I was born in, in Kenya, Nairobi. You know, me and my family uh, were living there, and we, uh, we we went to school there. And, and then around uh, when I was about five and a half years old, maybe a bit older, we decided to to move to Australia. And for us, it was it was a, it was a big thing. You know, family members and stuff in Kenya came, and everyone was saying goodbye. And I wasn't too sure what was happening at that time. I was I was quite young. Um, I wasn't sure how Australia was and how the how the people were going to be and um, the society and everything. But when we arrived, we um, we had, I think, a few family members here, which kind of made the transition a bit easier. And, yeah, they, they, they helped us out a lot. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for the for the opportunities and everything the, the, the country's uh, given us. And, yeah, it's changed my life completely. And do, you have, do you have many memories of Kenya or are you just too young? No, no, not really. I don't have too much. I just remember, like, always, uh, I was always out on the street with my brothers, and I was quite young at that time, and so I'd be following them everywhere, playing football at the park, and um, those are those are my fondest memories. I can't remember too much about it. 
And was was the reason your family left just to you know basically find a, a better life in Australia? Yeah, that was uh, that was mm, the main the main thing. Uh, my parents wanted us to to go to a place where you know we had more opportunities, you know, to to study or you know, to work or you know. So I think it was a, it was a good decision. Uh, Australia is a is a great country, and people don't realize it and, until you uh, until you move away. But yeah, we're we're really grateful. And so, talk talk to us about growing up, especially with um with AWAR and and your football. How how did you guys kind of you know form that friendship? The first time I met AWAR was in a place called um, Salisbury in Adelaide. He was playing at a I think at a, a club there. It wasn't it wasn't a big club I remember at the time. And because my cousins lived close by that club, we always used to always used to go to the park and, and kick the ball around and that's that's when I met him there for the first time and yeah at that time I think he just started playing football and he start, he started playing football quite late as well and yeah it just he, was, he just worked tremendously hard and he was always always at the park and always juggling and you know working his skills and and then I think he he went to a club called uh, play for Patriots and he did really well there. Uh, and then after, I think he got a he got a trial at Sassy, so with the South Australian Institute of Sport. And and then after he he went to Sassy, I went to Playford, <laughs> which is crazy. So I played at Playford um, as soon as he left. Uh, so we kind of always like followed each other. And then he went to the A League, and then a few years later, I went to the A League. And then um, yeah, he went overseas, and I went overseas. And then also with the Socceroos set up, he was in the Socceroos set up, and then eventually, uh, yeah, we met, we met again um, together, and yeah, we, we've, uh, we've been part of a, a few, a few games now, and um, he's uh, he's done well with the games that he's played in, especially in the Asian Cup. And he's uh, yeah, he's becoming a uh, probably a fan favourite for for many Aussies with his trickery and you know his ambition and passion. Tell us if you can remember what it was like to, you know, sign your first professional contract and make your professional football debut. Yeah, so when I signed my first contract at Victory, it yeah everything just happened so fast because I was playing at Green Gully and then I had a trial with the youth team and I made the squad. I played a one uh, one year of uh, NYL and then I played half a season of uh, of NPL. And then after uh, I got a two-year contract with Victory, um, and on my in my first year I, I played 13 games, and yeah, ev- everything just happened so fast. And then I went away with the with the Oli Roos. I was a late call up. Um, I think there was some some players uh, pulled out or they were injured, and then I, I went to Qatar. I was quite young at the time. I was about 18. I went there and uh, ended up playing a few games. I, I think. I played against Vietnam. I played really well, and then that's when uh, PSV came knocking and said that they wanted me to to go on loan. And my agent set up everything, and I went there. And it was it was a, it was a tough experience, um, but I think it was a it was a, a good experience, not only for football and also but also for for life. My life, um, I learned a lot, and I, I matured. As a, as a person, as a person, yeah. Yeah, tell us a bit about that experience. What did you find so tough about it? Just moving, moving abroad and playing at that level. Yeah, yeah, moving abroad and uh, also that level because the players were, were very sharp and very technical. For so for me, it, it took me about probably about six months to really, um, really come to grips with everything and um, get used to used to the tempo and. Um, the tech, uh, technicality, but once once I did, I, I felt really comfortable. It was just sad that I only had a year there uh, on loan with the option to buy, and you know, with the with the visa players in Holland, I think the the transfers are, uh, or the salaries are quite high. So sometimes it's it's a bit tricky on on the players that they want, and things didn't work out. So I ended up uh, coming to the A League, coming back to the A League, and. I just wanted to play games at that time. I wanted to play as much games as I can, uh, as I could, and, and try to improve um, as much as I could as well. And 
I come back and I, I spent three seasons at Victory and played uh, over seventy games, uh, which was which has been really good for my for my career. And how did what you learned at PSV help you at Melbourne Victory and you know even to this day? I think the the most important thing was just mentally. Um, it just made me stronger. Um, I went through a lot there. You know, also, you know, yeah, facing adversity and living alone as well um, was uh, one of the challenges. Also, my knowledge of the game um, grew. And I really worked hard on, uh, on my body as well over there and um, came back in really good condition. Had a pretty good season when I come back, scoring two goals and also winning the championship that, that season. What are your favourite memories from your time at Victory? Yeah, so my favourite moment was coming back in the first year, winning the championship. That's probably one of one of my highlights. Um, and then probably scoring that volley against Western Sydney is, uh, is another is another highlight. Just being able to play with uh, with some very good players, um, players such as Matthew Del Pierre, Guy Finkler, Archie Thompson, you know Costa Barbarusas, Leroy George, you know Rhys Williams. Uh, James Teresi, some some very big names, and also Carl Verri. Playing with them, I, I learned a lot, and yeah, I'm I'm very I'm very happy uh, to experience those things, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll cherish those uh, forever. If you picked one player who's the best player you've ever played with, who would you pick? Yeah, I'd say Leroy George. Leroy George is really good. Um, he's very tricky, technically very good as well. Yeah, like during the games, he, he just made things happen out of nowhere. Yeah, so he's probably one of the best players I've played with. Um, and I, I still stay in contact with him. I spoke with him the other day, actually. And who's the so, best player you've played against? I'd say uh, Oscar, a former Chelsea player. We played against them in the, in the ACL. I think I, I came back from injury and then um, I went right back came on and he was playing on uh, on the left wing. He, he basically just ripped me, cut inside and put it top right corner. And I was just like, there was like nothing I could do. <laughs> yeah, so he's, he's probably, yeah, the, easily the, the best player that I've played against. So you obviously, you've had these experiences in Australia and then going overseas, PSV, coming back to Melbourne Victory. Do you feel like all that experience in the past has prepared you well for this move? Yeah, hundred um, percent. All those games I played, and uh, yeah, everything that I've learned in, in the in, in the past. I'm just trying to, and also trying to trying to grow, grow my knowledge of the game here as well. Trying to apply it here, and you know, get better technically as well. There's always room for improvement. Um, I'm still still quite young, at, um, and it's yeah, it's good to experience this at a young age. <clears throat> and I think it'll put me in good stead for the rest of my career. So your goal is to get on the pitch and play, and play a game, but um, have you kind of set yourself any goals for the next few years? To be honest, at the moment, the, the moment is just to try to play as much games here um, at a role at Diamond and, you know, and, and make that Olympic squad. Uh, and then you never know, things, things can change. Um, you never know uh, who's watching uh, at that stage, and you know your life can change uh, straight away. All right, I'm going to take you through some quick fire questions really quickly. Yep. Basically, you can just you know give me one word answer or one word answer and just explain why. Basically. Yep. So, what do you consider your best personal trait? I can dance. Yeah, that's probably one. Got a favorite you dance move, pick. or where do you learn your dance moves, or? Ah, just mostly YouTube when I was young, always trying to, you know, uh, imitate, you know, people. And you know, one of my favorite artists is Chris Brown. So watching all these videos and, and things like that. So that's probably one of my hidden talents. So have you got a TikTok account where you're posting your talent nah, yet? My missus is trying to get me onto it. I was just like, nah, I'm not, I'm not trying to get on that. <laughs> <sighs> What do you consider your worst personal trait? Can be a, I can be lazy at, at times. I can be very lazy. You know, I can I'm, sometimes I'm like a sloth. I can be on the couch for hours and 
just on Netflix and kind of yeah, just put my phone down and just just chilling pretty much. <clears throat> Sounds like you've um you're you're living in the right the right period for that then. Oh mate, I'm in my element. <laughs> <laughs> What's your greatest fear? I think getting an injury, a career ending injury would be my greatest fear. Have you had any bad injuries? No, no nothing nothing serious um, so far. But I think, yeah, that would, that would be the worst thing uh, that you could think of. You know, yeah, having, a, having a really bad injury and, and stopping football at a young age. Have you had any friends who've had that happen to them? No, I don't, I don't have any friends, but I, like thinking of stories like uh, you know, Christopher Normoff, you know, things like that. It's, uh, yes, yeah, scary things. And sometimes you're not even aware of, uh, yeah, of, of things that can come out of nowhere. That's, mm. that's probably the, my greatest fear. What brings you the greatest joy? I think being able to, to help my family as much as I can. I think fo- football uh, yeah, has, has really, has really helped me and it's changed my life. And I'm, I'm yeah, I'm able to, you know, to, to support my family and, um, in ways that I, I couldn't have imagined before. What's your most treasured possession? Actually, mm, I've still got my first uh, victory jersey. So, like, when I... I think when I was in the youth team, I sat on the bench against Semper Coast and I wore number 34. That's... So I've still kept that shirt. And, yeah, I have... I have many, I have many shirts. I got my first soccer shirt, my first FA Cup uh, final shirt, also like also the, the grand final winning shirt for the A League championship. So you're not you're not someone to trade shirts. You'd rather just keep that memorabilia. I think if it's if it's the first time, it's good to to keep the memory. But like now, like I'll, I'll trade shirts. Um, it would have been good to to play in the Copa America to get Messi's shirt. He's uh, yeah, he's one of those players that I'd love to to hang up one of his shirts in, in my house, being able to tell my my kids and you know my families that I played against him. <laughs> if you could go back and relive one football moment, what would it be? This one sticks out: the 2014 um, World Cup. Uh, when Timmy hit that volley on his uh, on his left foot, that's a it's a big memory, and uh, he's been reposting on uh, on his Instagram uh, a few times as well. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's probably um, a good uh, good memory, and uh, I think something Aussies uh, remember quite fondly as well. <clears throat> if there's one moment you'd like to wipe out of your memory forever, what would it be? I can. Sc- Scoring on goals <laughs> as a defender. <laughs> Those are memories that you want to <laughs> you want to erase. I scored a I scored a few own goals. Uh, I think uh, my first season back in Australia against Sydney FC. I think like the ball came over my head, or and then you no, know, came over and it hit my leg. I was just standing there and it rolled in into the goal. And like I was just looked at my teammates. I was like, what the hell's what the hell's just happened? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> if you could change one thing about yourself, what would it be? I'd love to be taller. Don't think you're tall enough already? <laughs> no, nah, I'd love to be taller. It'd be easier to win headers. Mm. Same thing that Musti said. Yeah, is that what he said? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got a few inches on him though, so. <laughs> yeah. If you weren't a professional footballer, what other profession would you like to try? To be honest, I wouldn't. I wouldn't know what I'd be doing. Um, that, yeah, I really put put my, all my focus and energy towards uh, uh, football and making it come true. But like when I was in when I was in U twelve, I was just thinking of things to do. And one of the things is this personal trainer. I don't know. I like my. Uh, I like keeping fit and healthy. So I'll mm-hmm. be one of those. When you finish <laughs> playing football. What do you want the fans and writers to say about you? To be honest, I don't. I don't really think about that. I don't really. I don't really care what people 
people say or people write about me. As long as uh, as long as I'm a good role model for my family and for my kids, that's that's the most important thing. Mate, that's all I got for you. That is that is awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah. All right, take care, all mate. Right. All the best. Thank you very much. All right, no worries, yeah. mate. Thanks for listening to the Socceroos podcast with guest Thomas Dang. Dangy provided some great insight into what it takes to become a Socceroo and under-23s captain. You can learn more and keep up to date at socceroos.com.au as well as the social channels for all the latest news and videos on the team. Be sure to also check out our Matildas podcast, available at matildas.com.au and keep up to date with their latest news and videos. Don't forget to also get involved in the hashtag play at home challenge on social media. Every week, the Socceroos and Matildas will be posting a new skill challenge to complete and then tag your friends to attempt. Tune in next week for the Socceroos podcast and let us know on social media if there's players and questions you want answered. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye.